Hey there. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a rating and review on whatever podcast app you're using. It would really help spread the word about the show. Thanks and happy spelling. Hello, and welcome to Dispel Magic the podcast where we overthink how the magic of D&D might shape your campaign setting in surprising and unexpected ways. I'm Benjamin, game designer and writer. And my name's Dane. I'm a dungeon master, podcaster, and voice actor. Benjamin. Benjamin, can you hear me? I'm I can hear you, Dane. You. Yeah. Oh, oh, very good. From, a, from across the grave, Whoa! I speak to you. And that's because you've cast Speak With Dead which is the spell we're going to talk about this episode. That's right. Um, it, this, I, I really like this spell in games. Um, it really opens things up to players, but I, I also feel like it's not used in as many games as I would like. How, how often do you see this getting used? I'm not actually sure I can think of a time I've seen it used, even though I mm-hmm. bet in my games, it's actually particularly useful because you got a lot of dead people. Well, I tend to run pretty low combat, more intrigue, politicking type of stuff. So, you know, the spell would actually be super useful for a lot of the sort of situations that I tend to put player characters in. Let's hope that some of your players are listening to this very episode and they'll take advantage of this. Let me tell you about this particular spell, Benjamin. Please. please. Okay, I will. Speak with Dead is a third level necromancy spell available to bards and clerics. It takes an action to cast, has a range of 10 feet, and its duration is 10 minutes. Specifically, the spell text says, you grant the semblance of life and intelligence to a corpse of your choice within range, allowing it to answer the questions you pose. The corpse must still have a mouth and can't be undead. The spell, the spell fails if the corpse was the target of this spell within the last 10 days. Until the spell ends, you can ask the corpse up to five questions. The corpse knows only what it knew in life, including the languages it knew. Answers are usually brief, cryptic, or repetitive, and the corpse is under no compulsion to offer a truthful answer if you are hostile to it or it recognizes you as an enemy. Thus, the corpse can't learn new information doesn't comprehend anything that has happened since it died and can't speculate about future events. A couple of caveats there, yeah. but I, I think that's just to rein in the insanity that could occur. For sure. Yeah. There's a lot of, I mean, I actually think the idea of not learning new information is a really interesting twist. Like it makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, but it also is kind of a fun, it seems like a limitation, but when the more I thought about it, I think there's ways to use the fact that they can't learn new information also. Well, do you think the purpose of that is so that others can't come back around and it can't tell them that you already talk it or something like that? That was not something I'd considered, but that's very smart. That's kind yeah. of covering their bases here because right. it prevents subterfuge more subterfuge there's less of a liability than in casting it word because nobody later is going to find out that you spoke to that particular corpse just right off the bat we're talking murder we're talking straight up murder i think the obvious use of this spell the reason that most people are going to take it is because they imagine an adventure that kicks off with a with a murder and oh how quickly can i short circuit the whole adventure by just asking the dead guy who killed him yeah that really takes the the oomph out of the mystery hey it was the butler the butler did it the whole time kind of what spells do you know <laughs> take the oomph out of it yeah so you'd be seeing a lot more removal of the head completely getting rid of the head getting rid of the jaw getting rid of the talking mechanisms given that the obvious use of the spell is solving murders and and so you can imagine that clerics and maybe bards are recruited by law enforcement to solve these things then yeah the thing that immediately jumps out that kind of professional murderers or assassins would do is to remove the jaw so the creature doesn't have a mouth i can imagine that that would become kind of like a calling card of a particular uh, assassin's guild is that they take the jaw off of anyone they kill so that they can't speak at all about the nature of their death 
that kind of leads to maybe a, a hall of trophies of the famous jaws that have been taken off. So you infiltrate the guild and they just have this trophy room of a bunch of jaws mounted up, which is pretty grisly. That is pretty grisly. I like. I that. mean, I, I do like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> their jaw hall. Oh man, I had not thought of this before, but maybe even the assassins have their jaws removed while they're alive Ooh. so they can't share the secrets of their guild. Holy shit. When they're killed? Yeah. They would all learn like a sign language or something so that they can speak without. Oh, man, that's so disgusting. That's pretty gross. Well, and, and we also talk about prosthetic jaws, right? Right, right. Because it's good that D&D is not super legalistic. Like, I wouldn't want them to spend a lot of words clarifying exactly <laughs> what they mean every single time. But how many how many lawyers have you played with? Not rules lawyers, just straight up lawyers. Um, two. I played with my mom once and she's a lawyer and she disputed the wording of a spell for 20 minutes. <laughs> That's was, very funny. It was tough. Anyway, go on. Go ahead. So, yeah. So it says the creature must have a mouth, but it doesn't say that it has to be like the same mouth that it had while it was alive. Now that's interesting. So that makes me wonder if maybe you could create a prosthetic jaw and attach it. Mm -hmm. to in which case then i guess the people just remove the head completely and, yeah and probably attaching a prosthetic head doesn't count for the purposes of the spell <laughs> prosthetic head um, i think there's a, a comic book the screw off head or maybe it was a old cartoon as a dm would you allow a druid craft to create like a moss mouth on on a corpse if somebody could jerry rig up a little false mouth for for a corpse would you allow that i think it really depends yeah it's i a mean context. you know yeah it's a context thing i mean if i had specifically done that because i thought the corpse would have information that i couldn't let the party have i might be more on the side of saying it can't happen mm -hmm. but then again I, I always like to let players if they surprise me i always like to let them get away with it at least once sure if they do something that totally catches me off guard and is innovative in a way I wouldn't have thought of. I want to let them have that win over me, even if later then I have to say, okay, this doesn't work like all the time. <laughs> the moss falls apart. Doesn't right. work. There's a moss eating monster. It's going to attack you. Right. But I like this idea of the jawless, the assassin's guild. Maybe they do have that sign language, but maybe they have prosthetic jaws and that's kind of their calling card as well is that if they're dying they can get rid of them or, or crunch them or something so that they're they're no longer <laughs> like a cyanide tablet but an acid tablet that dissolves their their wooden jaws yeah, their wooden jaws and then they carry a little termite with them and the termite right. eats their jaw it's like a vial of termites that they keep in their <laughs> like under their tongue and they just bite it when the termite tooth a simpler way if you didn't want to go through the somewhat grisly process of removing a creature's mouth mm -hmm. whether that's their jaw or their head or whatever a simpler way is if your assassins could just cast speak with dead because the spell has a clause that it doesn't work on the same corpse for another 10 days kind of gives you a lead you can you can get going with without worried about somebody on your trail exactly which is kind of maybe more something an a non-professional, well, I guess even professional killers might do this. It's almost two weeks to yeah. hide, relocate, whatever remove else your, you need to do. Remove your own jaw. Right. You know, 10 days. That's a lot of time lot to of time. plan your way to appear innocent or to escape the law. Now, I'm, I'm excited for this next idea. I really love what you came up with for this next thing. You're talking about important people who have passed on with important information and creating libraries of their preserved heads. This this was really cool. Yeah, so the idea that that I had was that there would be these ossuary libraries, like these huge halls of bones. Mm. As far as I can tell, this works on skulls, like a, you know, yeah. a skeleton bones or a corpse. So as I say that, I also think the existence of the spell sort of compels people to, or d, &D societies to utilize mummification mm -hmm. techniques because they want bodies to stick around as long as possible so that they cast the spell on a corpse as long as possible. So maybe it's not an ossuary library. It's 
like just a tomb library mm -hmm. or something. And, and you said important people, but it doesn't just have to be important people. It could also be if you stumble upon some ancient ruins and there's somebody who died like a thousand years ago and somehow they've got an intact skull. You can learn every 10 days. You can ask five questions about what life was like a thousand years ago. Or Super what cool for like uh, archaeology. There's a ton of knowledge that naturally gets lost that doesn't have to get lost anymore with the existence of this spell. When I when I thought about this, I like really thought about what the actual bureaucracy, bureaucratic like arrangement of this would be. So I even thought like there's probably going to be like a card catalog system where you want to ask about a specific topic. And so you look up the topic and it's got like all the different skulls that you can go talk to that knows about that topic. And so every skull has an identification number where it's located in the tomb, the language it understands and speaks because the spell specifies that it only knows the languages it knew in life. And then the other kind of topics the deceased is known to have answers to. And this just kind of creates this really wild type of library and what kind of person works in that library and what are their daily duties? They're going around, they're casting the spell on ones that they need to know more information about. They're upkeeping, they're making sure rodents aren't around you know they're they're yeah, making sure yeah. the bugs aren't around and i'm almost thinking of heads under glass bell jars similar to a futurama or something where <laughs> yeah. you're, you're going yeah. through and you're kind of <laughs> cleaning the glass there's just a guy who clean cleans the glass yeah yeah well so i i'd mentioned mummification techniques as being something that might become common with the existence of the spell but there's also the spell Gentle Repose, which I think is a second level spell that when you cast it lasts for 10 days and it causes a corpse to not decay. For the purpose of the spell, the only parts of it that, that Gentle Repose matter is that it causes the corpse to not decay during that time. Mm -hmm. And the corpse can't be raised as undead during that time, which are like the two things oh, that's important. That, yeah. that can mess up this speak with dead. And Gentle Repose is a ritual. This person can just go around. Their job probably, is to preserve yeah, one the of the library. Yeah, one of the librarians' jobs is probably wandering around, casting gentle repose on heads every day. The kind of more local libraries that maybe don't have such a <laughs> person, then they have some process to clean all the flesh off of it. So they, they only have to take care of the bones. That's kind of grisly, but but also you know, this is the, this is our process. We put it in a pit with these bugs that take all the flesh off. Well, it's really neat because people, you know, sometimes people have this idea that they want to play like a good necromancer mm -hmm. and they wonder what that would look like. And this seems to me like a pretty noble end to take yeah. if you're if you're interested in necromancy. This is a total tangent. You can even imagine one of these good necromancers carrying around the heads of like their family members or something so they can just talk to their family members and well, as we were talking about it, yeah, I was thinking that maybe in society, it's not uncommon to keep important family members heads just like, you know, you have a fine china cabinet next to that is your ancestor head cabinet. The skulls of your ancestors. Yeah. And you're like, oh, what was that recipe for that casserole? Okay, let's we got to talk to great aunt Gertrude because she knew that recipe so well. There, there, there's some interesting story ideas and just like f world flavor stuff. We, we kind of talked about this library idea, but one of the things that really struck me though, is that people would make a really great effort to preserve famous philosophers, historians, and leaders, because these people could all continue to offer whatever lessons or guidance in death that they did in life. Now it, it's obviously much different you're asking five questions and then have to wait 10 days to get any more out of them. But it's, it's difficult to imagine the full consequences of that because it means that no one's ever truly gone. You can always kind of learn what their take on a certain thing would be. Why speculate when you could just ask? Right, right. Unless you're their enemy. Right. And they lie to you. So, right. Um, so, but, so then, I mean, yeah, that clause about the enemy thing had me thinking a lot about, well, I guess you could cast disguise self on yourself so that you looked like somebody else. And the other thing is that it doesn't say how it would know that you're an enemy, like by seeing you mm -hmm. or by what you're saying. Like maybe it's the language you speak or the accent you speak with that they might know. But if you could figure out why they think you're 
an enemy and you just wait it out for 10 days wait it out for 10 (laughs) days and then like try something new like wear a disguise change your accent or whatever else and try Mm -hmm. talking to them that time and then find out because they don't remember you from the last time you cast it right Uh, they don't retain the new information the philosophers uh historians leaders idea made me think that that'd be a fun story hook go fetch the head of this person who's been rumored to have died in this place you know i need to ask them something for my grand plan to come to fruition i I need this information go forth you know that sort of thing yeah i mean that's a really fun idea like okay well we know this guy is dead already so we're not sending our best it almost opens up an opportunity for like a first level adventure we don't need to send our best person because we know this guy's dead already but can you just go collect his head so and bring it back here and you say that you could also cast this on dragons Mm -hmm. phase fiends celestials anything that speaks the, a language that you can speak uh generally yeah. common i hadn't even thought of casting this on a giant dragon skull you come across this giant slain beast in the mountains and you can you can find out some cool stuff from this thing i, I think it's really easy to create a rule in your head about this spell that does not actually exist which is that the, the corpse is, does not have to be humanoid it's any corpse anything that ha- leaves a corpse and knows a language you could cast the spell on and yeah dragons is definitely the first thing i thought of is like how cool it would be to find a skeletal dragon or this not let's think a skeletal dragon is actually the name of a monster <laughs> to find the skeleton of a dragon and ask it some questions about like it's horde. i mean you mm-hmm. might even say like is anything in here cursed right oh that's a great question and that could even actually even be tied into the quest about going and finding somebody who died fighting a dragon maybe or something like the you could weave together some really fun stuff just with this one spell and you can imagine if these kind of tomb libraries are a big feature of your setting that there would be a special collections section of the tomb where they have the heads of these kind of, of dragons fey fiends celestials whatever where you can go and ask kind of about more esoteric topics and maybe you got to pay a little bit more to get in there. Sure, sure you, know? you do. Yeah, it's a premium. Yeah, I mean, the tomb library doesn't upkeep itself. Mm-hmm. Now, you bring up that the corpse can't be undead. If a player were to cast this and it doesn't work, then you can only assume that maybe this thing's undead or... I actually, I put out this question on Twitter and got a couple responses. But the truth is that it doesn't really matter how you interpret the spell because there's something interesting that happens either way so the the specific idea here is so the spell doesn't work on a corpse that is undead so if it's like a skeleton or a zombie like that's pretty cut and dry it just doesn't work on the skeleton of the zombie although maybe there would be the question of if you cut the head off the zombie does it apply to the head right. is, the, is the head dead now and the, well anyway where does the soul live sk- skip oh it. boy skip, skipping that question <laughs> the the real the real thought here is if i find a corpse and that corpse is the ghost of that corpse is haunting the area when i cast speak with dead on the corpse does it trigger because the ghost is not the same thing as the corpse or does it not trigger because the person that once was this corpse is now a ghost and so it's undead. And so you, you get to this thing where it's either, either you cast it on a corpse that's got a ghost and it doesn't work. And so, you know, that corpse is a ghost, especially if you can wait like 11 days, try it again and then say, Oh no, it's still not working. This dude's undead. Or it does work, in which case you can separately interrogate a ghost and its corpse. Oh, wild. To figure out, like, if like if one is misinforming you. Is it the body or is the soul? Because the corpse can lie to you. You know, Speak With Dead says the corpse can lie to you if it imagines you're an enemy. If you can interrogate them separately, you can kind of suss out whether or not there's a deception going on. You can uh, play good cop, bad cop. Right. Between the the, two witnesses. A ghost and a corpse that's actually the same person. Yeah. Now I'm I'm trying really hard not to make a Kingdom Hearts reference here. So I'm I'm just gonna stifle it. Uh but this has ramifications on Kingdom Hearts. I okay. I wouldn't know. But thank you. You're welcome. (laughs)
Well, I think that'll probably do us for this episode of Dispel Magic. Speak with Dead, a lot of crazy kooky things you can do with it. And if you come up with anything, dear listener, that we hadn't covered, then you can tweet at us about it at Dispel Magic Pod on Twitter. Benjamin, where can people find you? You can find me at Sterling Berman on Twitter. Great. And I am at Dane in Danger. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you after your next long rest. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Dispel Magic. If this has inspired any ideas for your game, or you have another take on today's topic, please let us know on Twitter, at Dispel Magic Pod. You can find Benjamin at Sterling Vermin and Dane at Dane in Danger. Thank you to Slim Mittens for our cover art, produced by Benjamin Huffman, produced and edited by Dean Fox McGraw.